Welcome well, to the world. Uh, joined Hunter the event by this building and Neural Media and MSA Net Manager of Rental. I want to do a quick thing where we all quickly introduce yourself and say your experience and that stuff because then it'll help your conversations and break. Uh, so if I start, uh, I've run Mirror Media or WordPress web design and build agency. Uh, we're located here in as well as we mainly focus on events and exhibitions and, um, and publishing sites. We've been doing it for about six years. Uh, so we've been working with WordPress solely for about six years. So who can do the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a Andrew, if Andrew did. Okay, so I'm Andrew. I co-organised with um, Don the event here, and I'm the technical director at a company called MSO, and we specialise in websites mostly in the education sector. So we work with mainly independent schools uh, throughout the UK and some international ones as well. Um, and we also have a sister company that make a software as a service product for education as well. So we've got sort of Two sides of the business. I mainly do assist a system developer, mainly a database, and I've been doing like this for about years. And uh, what person so I'm just kind of still hoping for the uh, not I'm Martin Long, I'm from a company called Sugar Marketing. We are a B2B um, integrated agency, really. We are we call us a brand communication agency. So we affect increasingly more so create content and push content out and use WordPress and WordPress platform to host content. Okay. There's Chris. I'm currently working for an IT support company. We've got WordPress currently inside WordPress. But have you been there? I'm currently also starting a cybersecurity blog on the side of WordPress and look at different technologies to do well. Okay. I'm Robert Mundy, I'm <laughs> um, a recent um, Open University IT graduate. I've worked with Shopify e-commerce and done research into SEO and work with uh, WordPress and uh, hoping to get off the ground in the next few months. Okay. Spencer? Uh, I'm Spencer. I'm a developer, uh, a freelancer developer in WordPress. How I feel about yeah. Uh, I'm Ben, uh, I'm a director of Operator Digital. Uh, we are a uh, WordPress developer and uh, manage to help uh, companies manage um, their websites as well as SEO. Hi, Stephanie, I just want to talk about building websites mostly WordPress for small. I'm Dan, I'm new to experience in the FTA, and I do a bit of security stuff. I'm Rob, I don't work in WordPress, I've built a couple of sites in WordPress, I've had a couple of sites in WordPress. I generally use PrestaShop and Magento and a bunch of other stuff, but I've sort of started businesses with other sites. And I haven't been in the game for three years. And I'm talking about going over to WordPress or going over to some custom software that's in one of those products. Okay. It's, a, it's like Press to Shop, but it's. Okay. So you're e commerce? Yeah, it's going to be e commerce, yeah. yeah. Okay. My name's Tim. Um, I'm ex IBM, and for 30 years I've run an interactive online design company producing training programs for corporates. Okay. Retired a couple of years ago, and uh, in August last year I started a daily. Satirical blog okay. of nonsense called Spoofly, and I've been posting every day. So I've got this huge learning curve of WordPress from last September, and uh, I'll keep going as much as I can okay. to improve it. Uh, Dan, uh, I'm an illustrator. Uh, um, okay. I do work in digital, but I'm just here to see what's going on. Okay. My friend seems to be disappearing into mine. Cool. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, okay. Hi. Right. So, everyone, um, today we're going to have a quick presentation from, or hopefully not too quick, but a presentation from Ben. Ben works for Automatic, who are the sort of guardians of WordPress, I suppose, in a way. Um, but I 
over to you to um, talk about yourself a bit more, but it's going to talk yeah. about Gutenberg. Okay. Right. Can so you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Very well. Um, Actually, Ben, before we start, I'll mute us. So, okay. any problems, um, just let us know. Yes. Well, I might need you. I might need some feedback, but we'll see how we go. Um, so, it's very nice to meet you all. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I really was really hoping to come actually because I'm from Kent. I grew up in Kent, uh, and I know Tunbridge Wells quite well. Um, so, I was hoping to come down and visit for the day, but. Unfortunately, I had to look after my son, so I'm near Birmingham. Um, so I'm afraid I have to join by video, which is a far inferior experience, but here we are. Um, I have some slides. I was going to share my slides, but then I realized when I shared my slides, you can't see my face. Um, and I thought it would probably be hard. Well, I don't know if you want to see my face or not, really, but um, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll just talk to you a bit without the slides, and then I'll turn the slides on when you get bored of looking at me. So, um, yeah, as, as um, Andrew said, I work for Automatic. Um, so Automatic, uh, the CEO of Automatic is Matt Mullenweg, who's the, the chap who started WordPress. So we, our, our aims are kind of aligned with WordPress's aims, but unlike WordPress, we're, um, we try and make money. So we kind of use WordPress to try and uh, actually run a business, as do lots of you by the sound of things. Um, and so Automatic, because we're owned by Matt, we uh, have, um, Matt's very keen that we do things that are good for WordPress, and not just good for us. So we we have teams who are just devoted to improving the WordPress core experience uh, and, and various other things. And so one of the things that has come from Automatic, or has, I suppose not just come from Automatic, because um, it's a project that was done with the involvement of the whole WordPress community, but I suppose it was probably driven by Automatic, is Gutenberg. So Gutenberg, um, you probably noticed in the latest um, of WordPress 5.0, um, Gutenberg came out and um, it's basically a really big change to the editor. So instead of having um, a kind of normal text editor inside WordPress, you have um, what we call a block editor. Uh, and this is a really big change in in terms of the way we edit posts, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, but it's also a really big change kind of looking forward to the future of WordPress, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that as well. So I, the talk kind of has a, a few... Um, let me turn my slides on, you can see. Um, we're going to talk a bit about... Where are we? Yeah. So that's me. So the problem, so why is this a problem in the first place? What problem are we solving? I thought WordPress was fine. Why are we changing things? Um, and then the second part is about, given that we think there is a problem, what what are the principles that we're actually trying to solve? What are the, what, um, what are the core things that we need to focus on or that we tried to focus on with Gutenberg? Um, and then, what actually is Gutenberg and look at a little bit the detail of what that means um, and then looking a bit to the future of well, okay this is where we are now how does Gutenberg help us to move forward into the future um, and what will that look like and then I've got some questions that I thought you probably would have and then hopefully you've got some questions of your own as well so hopefully that gives you an overview um, before we go any further I just just wanted to mention I'm going to talk about we in this, um, and when sorry. I say we, Ben, so, yeah, sorry, your slides have disappeared. We just got oh, there. oh, that didn't work then. It, it was there, there it oh, is. Okay, it obviously doesn't work when I do play, so okay. that's fine. Okay, cool. Um, so what was I saying? Um, oh, yeah, that's actually really ha handy. Anytime you have a question, just interrupt me, I don't mind at all. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, yes. When I say we, I'm talking about the people that built Gutenberg, of which I am not actually one. So I've done. A, I've been working with Gutenberg for about six months, um, but Gutenberg is a much older project than that. So I'm saying we as, as in the team that built Gutenberg, but really I can't take any credit for that. So I just want to put that out there so it doesn't sound like I'm making myself out to be the person that built this because this is, I wish I had, but this is um, this is not my work, unfortunately. So what's the problem? 
isn't isn't WordPress fine? Why do we need to change things? Um, that's something that that we heard a lot actually with Gutenberg, and I think that's not totally surprising. When you're used to the way something works, you tend not to see the problems with it. And if you're kind of a, a WordPress user and you already know how things work, you think it's fine. You think there's no problem because you've already learned how things work, and and it's it's easy for you. Um, so with that in mind. I had um, this little clip here. I wonder if this will play. This is me uh, trying to edit my own website using Customizer. And I think this just goes to illustrate that it's there's lots of different ways of editing the same thing. So that's me editing the menus. But now if I want to edit um, the, what was I trying to do next? I want to edit the content. Then I, I can't edit the content here. I have to click the edit button there. And then I go to a different editor. And so one of the problems is just that your settings are all over the place. So now I'm in a totally different place editing this content. And, and I suppose if you're used to WordPress, you know, oh, well, this is that's customizer. So you can't edit the content in there. And the other view, you're in the editor. So of course, you can't edit your template there. And to somebody that knows how WordPress works, that seems obvious. But when we do user tests and we watch real users using this stuff, they are really confused about this. They, they, the first time somebody uses WordPress, it's just baffling. They think, well, why can I edit this here and I cannot edit that there? Why are my widgets over here? All that kind of thing. So it's really eye-opening, actually. If you if you do a bit of user testing and you watch somebody who's not used WordPress before, they really struggle. So um, I kind of broken down that problem into five different um, areas. So the first one is uh, HTML mode. Um, I wish I was there so I could ask you this question, but um, just think about when you use HTML, uh, when you're writing a post in WordPress, how often do you flick from the visual mode to the HTML mode, HTML mode? Or in fact, how often do you just stay in the HTML mode because you don't want your markup to be messed up by the visual editor? I know that's something that I do a lot. Um, I'll always be flicking back just to make sure that things are how I want them. Uh, and when you when you're comfortable with HTML, that seems fine because you know you're just keeping things tidy and you understand how it works. But for users who don't know HTML, they wouldn't they would be too scared to go in there. And that's sort of a red flag, really. I suppose that's one of the things that you as a as a designer you notice. Oh, I keep going into HTML mode. Other users won't be doing that. So what's their experience like? Oh, if you watch uh, watching other users using it and you think, oh, just click HTML. Mode. Oh, no, you can't do that, can you? Because you don't know about HTML. So that that's kind of like a big red flag that made us realize, actually, there is a bit of a problem here. Um, another thing is uh, rich media posts. So WordPress is great for blogging particularly. And obviously, it was designed originally as a blogging platform. When you try and do things a bit more complicated, so if you want to do a nice photo spread with uh, your photos laid out really nicely, or you want to add video, uh, like full page video, say, or uh, you just wanted to make things not one column of text, you know, split your text up into different columns and have some images laid out, anything like that, but like a more magazine, newspaper type layout. The, the old editor you, is useless for that. It, you, I mean, you may be able to do it with hours and hours of work, but unless you really know what you're doing with your code or you've really got a lot of patience, you just can't do it. Even something like aligning in an image to the right for a user who doesn't know how to do it is really baffling. And that's, I suppose, where the, when you come to complex layouts, thinking about, and this is where we end up, we do lots of things for users. I suppose if you're building site for users um, with a more complex layout, you have to either use some page builder plugin like Elementor or you have a lot of page templates and a lot of custom post types. And it really starts, for, for a user who doesn't know about that stuff, it's just baffling. Uh, another place we saw this problem, uh, this comes up all the time uh, for us, is theme setup. So when a user selects a theme, they um, expect probably that or what we what we see is that they expect that when they select the theme, they see basically the demo theme on their site. And that isn't obviously what happens. What happens is your content is put into that theme. And so your site looks nothing like the demo you looked at. And so if a user wants to get that set up, so they want the content slider set up, or they want a full page video or something like that, 
it's not at all obvious how they do it. And that for us certainly is a huge, still is now, because Gutenberg hasn't solved this problem yet, is a really big pain point for our users. Uh, and the same thing can be true for switching themes. So sometimes your theme might have a content slider, say, and you switch to a different theme and that theme doesn't have the content slider anymore, but it has like a really nice uh, cover image or something. And what we see often is users who say, oh, I really want the slider from that theme and the, co the um, cover image from that theme. Oh, and I want full page video from that theme. And at the moment, with the way, or certainly with the way WordPress used to work, that's just not possible because you can't cherry pick features from different themes. And I suppose what you start to realize is that um, the problem is that themes have been made too clever. Themes have been made to do a lot more than they should be doing. Themes should really just be about the way your site looks, the presentation layer, and they've become a lot more about features and a lot more about um, providing particular experiences. So um, maybe I'll just turn my, where am I? Uh, oh yes, here. Just turn that back on just for a bit of a change. So where am I up to in my notes? Okay, yeah. So then we, I suppose then what we got to doing is we're thinking about these problems and um, thinking about, well, how do we solve, how do we solve this issue? Because there's a lot of different things wrapped up in this. And I suppose the thing is we're trying to boil all these different problems down to just a few key problems. Um, and what we came up with was three things, or what I've boiled it down to here in my talk is three things, the three principles of Gutenberg, which um, really help if we can solve these three things. So the first one is that users should only need to learn one interface to learn WordPress. So at the moment, like I was saying, showing in that little video, if you want to edit your site, you need the editor, the page editor, or the post editor, the customizer, um, then you need, but then inside the customizer, it's actually more complicated because you've got one interface for editing your menu, one interface for editing your header, one interface for editing your sidebar. Then you've got, if you want to do like feature post types, you need to set the images for your feature posts. Um, you've got custom post types. And so you're always, whenever you're doing stuff, you're always sw switching around all over the place. And so Gutenberg, one of the aims is everything in one place. Just keep all of your editing for your whole site in one interface. That's the first principle. The second one is that it should be visual. Um, or what we would call direct manipulation. So rather than um, editing your menu kind of in the sidebar like you do in the customizer and then watching it update sort of next to it, you just edit the menu in place so that it's there's a much stronger connection between what you're editing, the content you're editing, and what you see. Um, so we call that the idea of direct manipulation, that you actually edit the content itself rather than editing something that's tangentially related to it. So that's the second principle, direct manipulation. And the third one is that there should be no coding necessary. So we shouldn't expect users to have any level of um, technical knowledge or any coding expertise to be able to use WordPress. It should be something that anybody who can use a computer can do without knowing how WordPress works, without having technical understanding of CSS or HTML or JavaScript or anything. Uh, I'll turn my slides back on again. So there they are, the three principles. One interface, direct manipulation, no coding necessary. And so with those principles in mind, we came up with the idea of blocks. Sorry, Ben. Yes. Did you say you switched the slides back on because we're still seeing you? Oh. Oh, that's strange. <laughs> uh, I mean, the slides aren't that very, well, they're just headings. They're not that interesting. But okay. let's see what's going. I'm used to this again. <laughs> what? Not as interesting as you. Oh, yeah. How about that? Can you see that now? Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Blocks. <laughs> so this is the idea. This is the kind of principal idea of Gutenberg. Blocks. Um, everything is a block. The block is like the key the uh, the base unit of of Gutenberg. So um, what does that mean exactly? Uh, so I suppose uh, let's just think think about what 
WordPress was like. So previously, with the old editor, Tiny MCE was that sort of, you know, you've got that box where you edit your content, and then at the top, there's all the buttons and stuff for editing stuff. That's Tiny MCE. That's, that's an old plugin. That's basically the old the thing that Gutenberg is replacing. And that's really good for text-based content. It's like, um, I suppose it's a bit like Microsoft Word or something. It's, it's really good for creating um, a long one column text, maybe a, a few images dropped in. Um, it's not good for different types of content. Uh, and so what we, what we want to be able to do is create rich text, uh, rich media posts. So that means using the media library uh, for images and videos, using embed codes, whether that's like YouTube or Vimeo or embeds from other sites. Um, short codes, so um, like short codes are good for putting in different bits of functionality from uh, different services, or you might have your own custom short codes. Um, and then widgets as well are another way of kind of creating custom content in your site. So we're kind of taking all these different ways that we have creating content, and instead of having them all be different types of thing, we're just saying, no, all of these things are now blocks. So yeah, that, that that's kind of the mindset shift you have to think about. It No longer do we have all these different short codes, widgets, blah, blah, blah. All you have now, or certainly the future of WordPress, well, the way we're going is, everything will be a block. Uh, and the, the one of the things that's really good about that is that once you learn how to use blocks, then you don't have to learn anything else. So the, the mechanism for adding or editing or removing a block is the same, whether you're in whatever kind of part of the site you're working on, it's always the same because it's always just a block. And so that, that starts to kind of speak to that first principle, where was it, of um, one interface. If everything's a block, then it's it's all much simpler. Oh yeah, here's the list. Um, the second thing that we we need blocks to do is to enable visual editing. So, and this is one of the things that you, you if you're thinking about creating blocks, you really need to start understanding that a block should look like the content that is in it. So when you add an image block, it what you see is the image. You don't see um, like the URL of the image or some text that describes the image, you actually see the image because, and that's really important because obviously the user wants to know what the block will look like on their site. So we show the block on in the editor as if it, as it looks in the site. And the third thing which helps with this idea of uh, no coding being required is that a block is really a self-contained piece of functionality. It's, um, it keeps everything within itself. It does, it shouldn't, um, influence other things that are happening on your site or other things that are happening on the page. It's, it's self-contained in that way. And that's really important because that means that if you can understand what's happening, all you have to understand is what's happening in that block. You don't have to understand about settings anywhere else um, on your page or anywhere else on your site. We just keep everything kind of self-contained like that. And that hopefully makes it much easier for users to understand. Um, so that those three things, uh, like answers to the three principles. Hopefully you can see that. But one of the things that's happened actually is, as a result of creating blocks is we've we've had these other benefits that have uh, come to light. So um, that's why these are numbered four, five, six. So number four is placeholder content. So a block can have what we call placeholder content, which is like default content, default copy. So um, if you this can be really useful, say, if you're creating a site for somebody and you wanted um, recipes, say, you could create a recipe block. And instead of it just being empty, you could actually put uh, like recipe name and then some example ingredients and some example instructions when somebody adds that block. And that is certainly in our, in our experience and with our research, that's really useful to users because hopefully you can empathize with this, I know I can. Staring at a blank page with nothing on it is really intimidating. It's really scary, and you don't really know where to get started. But if the content's filled out for you and it, you just need to change it, that that seems much easier for most people to, to handle. They can see, oh, it says three eggs, but I need it to actually give you four eggs or you know, whatever. Once the content's there, you can really 
you can just start to interact with it and understand where things are going to go much more easily. So that's a, another benefit of uh, blocks. Um, the, another thing that's really good with blocks is that it helps developers. So if you're building a plugin for WordPress, often um, you what you'll do is you'll add another set it another kind of tab on the sidebar in WP Admin. Uh, and you hope that your users realize that it's there and know to go in there to edit the settings for that plugin. Um, or as a user, I suppose it's good as well because that's really not intuitive to know, oh, I've installed my plugin, now I have to go here and edit it. What happens now with Gutenberg, if you install a plugin with blocks, is that that block will now appear as one of the options in your block editor. So that, um, that gives developers the tool to get right where users are in the editor. Maybe I should show you this actually. Um, I've got a post open here, I think. These are my notes for the talk. Look, this is in Gutenberg. So if I wanted to add a new block at the end here, I just. Uh... Sorry, Ben, we're seeing the slides still. Uh, okay. That's... Um... Doo -doo -doo. Oh. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, how's this? Yeah. Okay, so this is me using, this is my notes. This is me uh, using Gutenberg on my site. So if I want to add a new block, I hit this uh, plus thing, and I get a list of all the blocks on my site. So some, most of these blocks are core blocks, but um, we've got Jetpack working on my site. So I also have all these Jetpack blocks here. So any any plugin developer can add in a new section here for their plugin, or they can actually add their own blocks under these different different categories. So it makes it much easier to get your, as a developer, it makes it much easier to get your features directly in front of users because they can see, um, they can just see them right there rather than having to look for, hunt around for them in WP Admin. And the other, what was number six? Um, I've got it here. Oh, front-end editor, yeah. So Gutenberg isn't a front-end editor. You're still in uh, the admin part of your site when you're when you're working on it, but it's much closer to a front-end editor. And um, let's turn that off again. Where did I go? And that means that it's, uh, the, because the preview in inside Gutenberg looks like the site that you're editing, it's just much easier for, for users to understand what they're doing. And, uh, and that's really an engaging experience, we find. So where are we up to in the slides? Let me turn the slides back on again. How, has anyone got any questions? How are we going doing so far? Yeah. That sounds of, tons of questions, Ben, but it's probably best you just carry on and then we... All right. Before I tell you, I can tell you I've done a steer and don't even close down, so... Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess it's more if anyone has any clarifications on what we've already covered. Yeah, no, we're good. I think okay. We're good. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Cool. So... So the, like I said, the base unit of Gutenberg is is blocks, and that's the uh, the kind of the first building block, if you pardon the pun. Um, the another there's another part which is really important, which is templates. So templates are combinations of blocks. If you think of a block as being like a Lego brick, a template is like the instructions that come with your Lego kit. So they, uh, it's like a set of pre-configured blocks that can have some content in them, might have some, some pre-selected images. So like if we go back to the example of a recipe we were talking about earlier, a template could actually be a list, which would be your ingredients, uh, an image block, then a paragraph block, which might be like a description of the, of the recipe. And that actually not, you don't need to create a new block for that. That's just a, a combination of blocks that already exist with predefined content, an image, some text, all of that, and that would be like a block template. And that's a really powerful thing because it, it doesn't actually require much coding. You don't need to create any new blocks for this. It's just like uh, some setup. Basically, you're setting up. These are the, the kind of basic defaults. Uh, and that makes it much more accessible for anybody to 
well, not anybody, but for people that are a little bit familiar with code to set up rather than the idea of creating a new block, which is actually a lot more involved as a developer. You need to learn JavaScript and all of that kind of stuff. But just creating these templates is really simple. So that's definitely something that um, is a really powerful feature that's really accessible and something that if you're just getting started with Gutenberg, you, you should be into more. Uh, a third part of Gutenberg I just wanted to mention briefly is the idea of reusable blocks. So this is also really powerful. If you imagine, say, the example we usually talk about is testimonials. So if you've got um, a testimonial on your website, um, a really good quote from Stephen Fry or something, and you want to show it on three different pages, instead of creating the block three times, uh, you can just create one reusable block, and it will be using the same the same code in the, the same kind of copy of the block in each place, which means if you edit the block, you only have to edit it once and it will update on all those different places it's used. Um, so that's obviously really useful in terms of as, as a user because you don't have to keep entering in the same content over and over again. Um, it's also useful um, in terms of the way that we've used WordPress in the past. So previously, you would use custom post types or something like that for um, this kind of feature and as a user that's really inaccessible and you probably need a developer to set that kind of thing up for you whereas or you just wouldn't and you do it manually whereas reusable blocks make that kind of thing really accessible just to anybody they, you anybody can set up a reusable block it's just an option when you create blocks you just say I'll make this a reusable block so that's another really powerful feature um, okay I thought it would be worth just a bit of time thinking about okay so with these things in mind, actually, how is Gut how can Gutenberg help me? Uh, and I've sort of thought about two different elements for this. So as a WordPress user or as a developer or a designer or a site builder or something. So as a user, how does how does Gutenberg help me? I think that probably the most compelling thing is um, it just helps you to build a much more interesting site. Um, the options that are available to you in terms of layout, in terms of using more rich media in your posts, uh, and integrations with other services, that kind of thing. It, it just makes things much easier from that perspective. And increasingly, that will become the case. I think at the moment, it's still very much in its early days. And so we're not seeing all of that promise happen yet. But as it grows and as it becomes starts to take over more parts of WordPress, that will become more and more the case. Uh, as a designer or a developer or someone that builds websites, um, there's a lot of opportunities here, I think, for um, the way that you, the, the basically creating blocks or creating block templates for your clients. So features that previously you've had to build as plugins or um, setting up custom post types or telling users, oh, don't edit it this way, edit it that way. Um, it all becomes a lot simpler with blocks because you can give your clients these these pieces of functionality as a block and they can reuse that anywhere they like so if they want if you build say a content slider um you don't that you don't have to be restricted to where you've put that code in your theme you can build it as a block and they can add it to as many pages as they want or if you build them you know any piece of custom functionality they can add it to different pages they can edit it in place um so hopefully that that's compelling also i think in the past certainly when i've built client sites i've always been scared about well what's going to happen if they go in the user goes in and edits the html and breaks the post and then they end up calling me because they've messed it up and that that's happened to me lots of times actually uh, and with gutenberg that i think that takes away some of that pain because because everything's a block you the users should never be going into html mode and it, every it, the, the bits are very discreet and they like I was saying the lines of responsibility are separate so hopefully there there's much less interference and that kind of thing doesn't happen so much um I expect you'll have more questions about that the future of Gutenberg so um to try and live up to the promise that I spoke about at the beginning there's there's some I guess you have to understand where Gutenberg is going to really achieve that. So, and to understand that, you have to understand um, the approach that has been taken to implementing Gutenberg. So, one option would have been if we were creating a new site builder or a new page builder or a new editor or whatever, is to just throw away the old thing, 
say right from this date everything is everything's new we're going to use this new builder any posts that were created before this date will stop working in wordpress and now everything needs to be we're using this new builder and um that would have been extremely painful because wordpress tries really hard to to maintain backwards compa compatibility with older versions and so instead the approach that's been taken is a much more incremental approach or a bottom-up kind of approach so that for example today if you want to create pages still using tiny mce in the old way without really worrying about gutenberg you can do that you can add a classic block to your um post and that will work that so a classic block still has the tiny mce header it still works exactly like the old wordpress and everything works fine and you can use those blocks <coughs> with gutenberg blocks so actually you can kind of you can kind of have a uh, an approach where you do a bit of stuff with blocks and a bit of stuff in the old-fashioned way that you're happy that you're happy with and so that that's very much the way that the project's been approached that it's not just about a whole new start it's about trying to keep things working as they were but also opening the doors to a new a new way of working a new way of doing things um so then what the next kind of phases which are actually happening at the moment if you are involved at all with wordpress core work is the that gutenberg is now moving from just being in the page editor uh, or the post editor and it's actually becoming part of other other bits of wordpress so uh, instead of having widgets the next version of, Google, of WordPress will have widget blocks. So that means that all your widgets are now Gutenberg blocks. Um, someone's also working on, I'm not sure if this would be in the next version, but it's coming in some version of the future, menus. So menus, instead of being a separate thing, will also be Gutenberg blocks. And that's still happening kind of alongside this work. It's not all being integrated together yet, but this is all laying the groundwork for some time in the future when everything on your site will be a Gutenberg block and will be editable all in that one screen. So the page editor will stop being just the page editor and it will become a site editor and everything on your site that you look at will be a Gutenberg block and it will be editable in that one interface. So yeah. Ben, can I ask, so if we've got, if we've got bespoke widgets that we've been are they is it going to be ways to convert those to Gutenberg blocks? Um, was the question will 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 widgets continue to work with Gutenberg blocks? Yes, yeah, so, I mean we, we say we've got a, 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 a we've written a widget that integrates with a custom post type that we've written. Is it going to be relatively simple to move that widget to work on Gutenberg as a as a general block on Gutenberg? It will it will work. It will work as it is today. Short codes the same. Um, the so short codes will be what there'll be a book of a block called short codes that basically puts the short code in. Yeah. That that is that, that already happens today. Um, the that's fine. It works. The the thing that's not great about it is the the UI is pretty terrible. You don't have all the editing tools that you have with the Gutenberg block. So. If I, um, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Let me show you my screen again. Mm -hmm. So we come back in here again. So when I create a block, if I just create a paragraph block, when I'm typing, I have controls within the block. So I've got alignment controls here, um, more things here. Then I also have a sidebar, which gives me more settings. If you were just inserting a short code, you wouldn't have any of this. You just have the short code, so it would work, but it wouldn't be um, the same kind of. It wouldn't provide the same level of uh, user experience as a Gutenberg block would. So it's it's good in that it doesn't break anything, uh, but it's. I think the the point is that it's in your interest really to tr to look at how you would build that as a Gutenberg block going forward like it th there's not an urgency to do it because it will continue to work but if it's something that you want your users to carry on using into the future um building it as a gutenberg block will probably be useful for them 
and convert it. So, for instance, if you look at an example of a widget, so with a mobile widget, and you can set up an event, you put a date, you put a, like a link or something. It's so about three or four fields that are in JavaScript field, called JavaScript potential. If I wanted to convert that to Gutenberg block, would it be a, a, a relatively simple case? Or would it be the underlying code be the same? I just going to change a few things. Like it would, especially if it's. Especially if it's already written in JavaScript, because blocks—I mean, blocks don't have to be just written in JavaScript. They can be in PHP as well. But um, is I would... it a widget that uses some JavaScript to create a good a short code? Right. Yeah, that sounds like it wouldn't be a big thing to convert in a big job to convert it into a block. If you've got all the code there already, it's more the work would probably be less in the coding and more in the design of thinking. Well. Because the challenge is with a, with a block. So let me show you an ex another example of a block. Um, uh, so this is one of the ones I worked on recently. Um, contact him. Uh, yeah, let's do that one. Oh, that's not a great one. Actually, let's do contact form. I'm not telling you your screen again, but... Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do, 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 do. Where have you gone? Okay. So if I add a um, new block down here, like a contact form block, the thing, where's it gone? So um, it has this. This is like a placeholder for the for the block until I've got it set up. So I'm going to tell it to send my email, send the contact form emails to myself. I just have a rubbishy subject line, and then you see it's the contact forms here, and I can edit like the details here, your name, <coughs> and these things. So I'm editing the block in place, um, and so I think the the challenge certainly we've seen the challenge with creating these blocks is more in thinking, how do I build my block in such a way that users can still still work with the content and edit the content that's there? So it's more of a design challenge, actually, than a coding challenge. Often the coding is, is pretty simple. You might already have the code from another, like you're saying, from your widget. But it's, it's kind of getting into that mindset of, well, my user's actually going to be interacting with the content directly. So and sometimes it translates really easily. Like this, this example does translate quite easily. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated, actually. How that? So, like we did one recently. There was Giphy, uh, a GIF block, um, and this was a bit more. Um, search for something fish. How do you actually um, make this still where the user gets a preview? Because obviously, if I when I see this, it's going to look like that. So I still want the user to understand that this is what they're going to see, but at the same time, I want them to be able to interact with it, and and that's kind of where the challenge is. Where you you it's more of a design challenge, I think, than a technical one. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. So at the end, the end result of this, the, the back, if you look to the code of this page, it'll be a short code there, probably. Uh, no, it will be. How can I see it? Um, so yeah, here. So all of these. Um, Blocks they're wrapped in uh, HTML comments, so they can they keep working with old versions of jo of WordPress. They're just ignored, uh, and you have attributes. So, I guess if it was a short code, it would probably have the short code um, attributes here. Um, and in this case, like the the GIF one's got the URL of the image and any other kind of custom. So, like here, the content form has got the custom subject that I set. Things like that. So it, in the background, it's it's basically these JSON objects. You're building basically you build a JSON, big JSON um, description of of your content. But hopefully, no user ever sees that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in this particular Giphy example, it's a mixture of what the user sees and what. The editing experience and mixture of what you use the season still. Yeah, that's right. So when you when you click off it, this is something I'm going to come on to, to next. So 
Blocks, you have two different modes. You have like the preview mode, which is what I'm in now, where it just looks exactly the same, hopefully. Oh, it should do. And then an editing mode where you try and make it look as close to what the preview, the um, yeah, the preview mode is. But obviously, you need to make sometimes make some concessions to uh, actually making it possible to to use. And so there's a bunch of trade-offs that you have to make there. So we had originally we had this search field over the top of the image and these thumbnails over the top of the image to try and make it more so that it would be the same height effectively. Um, and it was just, we just felt that wasn't actually very usable. So there's a bit of a trade-off, but I don't think it matters that much because when as soon as you click off, as soon as the block's not focused, you see that preview mode. So it's really easy to switch between the two. Um, while we're talking about how blocks work, let me just point out um, the, the kind of three different elements of a block. So this is the primary content area here. It's in this block, in this uh, kind of gray outline here, all the same here. Um, and then in addition to this primary content area, we have a secondary editing area, which is this uh, at the top here. What's this called? I always forget what this is called. Let me look it up. Um, do, do, I've got it around here. Oh, the block toolbar. So this has got kind of settings which are quite important and don't really make sense inside the main block. Uh, and then you have, you know, deleting or duplicating or whatever. And then we have on the side here, the block sidebar. So this is really, um, you've got to be really careful with this block sidebar because uh, on mobile, this is, this is hidden. So if a user doesn't really know how to use Gutenberg much and hasn't used it before, you they won't know that this is here. So you you can't put anything in this sidebar area that um, is crucial, that's important for the the uh, the functioning of your block. It can only really be for tertiary controls, sort of. So generally, it's basically extra CSS classes you might want to apply. Or if you want to say change the background color of the block or anything like that, which isn't important to the actual functioning of the block. Um, yeah, so that's that's important to know, especially if you're creating blocks. Did you have any more questions? <laughs> okay, um, let me just finish off with what I was saying. I have a question about that, that stuff that's hidden. If you go back to the screen, can you just show Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, right. If you click on doc, on the right, you click on document, and that gives you all the things like categories and stuff like that. So you haven't got access to that on mobile. You have got access to it, right. but it's just hidden when you're editing the post. So you have to know to get access to those. You have to click on settings. So on mobile, you can still access it. Yeah, it's all, it's all accessible. It's just, um, we can probably collapse it down and see, can we? It just looks like this, and then you have to do that to get to it. So if you don't know that it's there, it's and it's probably like that in the old editor as well. Have you got a demo, whilst you're there, have you got a demo of this, um, where, you, where you mentioned about creating blocks and then being able to import them into any any page? That's as a user, isn't it? It's not just as the... Yeah, so um, how would I do that? So I could this this uh, amazing this amazing Giphy block here. I could make it a reusable block there. I could call it Giphy block. Is that actual picture of Bill Murray? And yeah. <laughs> and so now, if I go to uh, come out up here and I create a new post. Mm -mm -mm. If that worked, I should be able to add that to my new post. So uh, reusable blocks at the bottom here. There we are. Yeah, there he is. So obviously for, <laughs> for a picture of uh, Bill Murray, it's probably not super useful. But if you've got more complex content there, that could be potentially pretty powerful. Yes. Okay, um, the other thing I was going to tell you about in terms of the future of Gutenberg, let me just turn this off. So there it is. 
um, is the block directory. So this is an idea which is still very much in its infancy, but the idea is basically like like we have a plugin directory today on WordPress.org, and you can you know we have a list of all the different plugins there are. The idea is that there will be a block directory um, which contains not all of the blocks that exist, but a huge a lot of blocks. Uh, and oh, I probably should show you this again. Um, so remember the block picker here, if I create a new block, I have the block picker. So the idea, and this is still, we haven't, this hasn't been decided what's gonna happen, but the idea would be, so say if I search for SEO here, no blocks found. Well, that's because I don't have any SEO kind of blocks on my site, but what we could do, so this is what will happen in the future or something like this, is that if there are blocks in the block directory that somebody else has created that I haven't installed on my site yet, which are about SEO, they would appear here. So that is a um, kind of much more direct way of reaching people than the plugin directory, because in the plugin directory, a user has to know, oh, I'm looking for this thing, and I have to go to my plugins and search for it. And they have to know that plugins exist in the first place, which for people that know about WordPress is, seems kind of obvious, but for people that don't know about WordPress, is it's another thing they have to learn. Whereas this, all they have to learn is, oh, I just, to make content, I just use this plus thing, and that's where stuff is. And then if I if I want to do some SEO and I can't find a block that tells me, then I can have an option here that says install this SEO block or whatever. I don't know what an SEO block would do, but you, you get the idea. Like, it could be anything. Um, and so that provides a really, I think, a really interesting opportunity for developers to, uh, it's a bit like um, a greenfield opportunity, isn't it, that, that these, the, none of these plugins exist yet because the plugin directory, the block directory doesn't exist. But when that does exist, there's going to be a big kind of land grab to get in there and create those blocks. But just to use that SEO as an example, say the Yoast plugin there, and you, and you didn't have the Yoast plugin installed, um, how would that then, and you selected it, would you then go and install the, the, the database? Files. No. So the block directory is different to the plugin directory because the block directory would only let you have, it would be a, basically a specialized type of plugin. So it only, ha all it does is it allows you to use blocks. So each, each block in the block directory can only uh, offer one block. It can only offer a JavaScript block. There can be no PHP. Um, it can't make any other changes to your site apart from giving you that one block. Um, and there are a few other more technical um, requirements. I can't remember what they are. Is this inside the content, inside the body? Of the, the yeah. So it's it's not another way of installing plugins. It, it won't let you install existing plugins. It's more like kind of mini plugins, another way of delivering like mini plugins that um, can still bring value to users. Example where it doesn't require any change to your site, it just goes and fetches a service that someone else is providing. Yeah, that would be that would be a really useful useful case. So say like YouTube could could offer a block in the block directory. You search for YouTube, you see the YouTube block, you install it, and then that lets you add YouTube videos to your site. Okay. I don't know if you know the answer to this yet, as to whether it's been decided or not, but is there any sort of control over what type of users can install blocks. I assume there would have to be some sort of user control on that. Uh, yeah, I don't think anything like that has been decided yet. I sub I would think that if you can edit posts, then you could edit blocks, but I'd imagine there's security concerns and things that all need to be thought about that just, that just hasn't happened yet. It's still very much in the design phase of thinking about what that would look like. Um, so the only other thing I've got here on my notes is um, questions. So I had some questions that you might ask. <laughs> I'm trying to anticipate your <laughs> questions before they come. Where is it going? That's right. Um, on this. Oh, okay, questions. Questions then. Okay. So uh, first question is how do I use blocks? I already covered that. Hopefully, gave you a quick overview. The second one, uh, well, it's sort of two questions really. What about themes and what about plugins? 
So we can do the plugins because I think it's easier. Plugins, this doesn't really change plugins at all. Uh, plugins will carry on working as they work today. Um, the only difference is, I suppose, if you're creating a plugin, you might want that plugin, you should really make that plugin provide its its content. It depends what the plugin does, but probably there's going to be a lot of plugins which want to add blocks to the plugin so that the user can access the stuff that it does directly from the editor without having to go into a separate plugin screen. But that very much depends on the plugin. Themes, this changes a lot, actually. So. Um, like I was saying before, themes themes basically started off in WordPress as a way of modifying the presentation layer of your site. It was just really a layer of CSS. Um, maybe the, the group moved content around a little bit, but it was really just almost like a CSS in garden thing, if you remember that, laying over different ways your site can look, but everything sort of stays the same. And what happened was that the users basically wanted more comp complicated sites. Users wanted more advanced features. So they wanted content sliders or full page video or uh, full width headers or you know all these different things that we have on sites now or, or more advanced things. And mm -hmm. themes started to provide them because that's what users wanted. And, and there was, that was the easiest way to provide them. And like I mentioned before, that created a bunch of problems. So with Gutenberg, the idea is that that is that trend is reversed and that that functionality that has been in themes for so long actually comes out of themes and goes back into the editor into the uh, into the content creation and themes then become ju again just about content uh, sorry just about presentation not about content and so a theme should really just be or in the future at least it will become um CSS, so CSS, which still modifies the way the blocks, the Gutenberg blocks look, um, so that they will they'll appear different. You know, have different fonts, different colors, different sizes, um, that kind of thing. But they won't be themes won't be adding new features to a site, and also themes will be able to provide block templates. So, like remember, if we go back to the recipe example again, if you wanted to provide a theme which was targeted towards people who want to make recipes. You could create a theme which looks great, has great presentation for recipes, but you could also create with it these block templates which um, and make it really easy for users to get set up with a recipe with the default content and all of that kind of stuff, which actually, in a way, it provides you with more power than you had with the old way themes work because themes before, even though they had a lot of power in terms of the features they could add, they didn't have... Um, very good ways of, I didn't really have a way of giving users default content. So that's a, quite a big change to, to themes and what's happening in themes. The other, oh, sorry. the other thing just to mention with, with themes is um, there are a few things that Gutenberg adds, like one example is a cover image. Gutenberg gives you this option to have a full screen image uh, and you, not all themes support that. So some themes, well, all themes probably, need modifying in order to support certain well they don't need modifying but if you want your theme to work well with gutenberg there's probably changes you should make to it so can i have a template sorry can you just, can you just use an example say that i'll give you an example okay so there's a blog and there's three different types of article the blogs you know looks and it says a magazine it says the sun newspaper or something uh, but much more simple than that um the, the, the theme would be the overall look of the site, would it? The template yeah. would be the content type, and the templates would just be a collection of blocks that then would pull in the content. Yeah, that's right. So um, you might have, like, the, yeah, so the newspaper would have, like, the, the layout of the content and, the, like, the leading between the lines and the fonts and the the general look of look and feel of the site would be in the theme. But then you might also have, say, like one page layout that's for features, one page layout that's for like news, one that's for, uh, I don't know, like classified ads or something. And you could, each of those could be block templates within your theme. So when a user creates a new page, they can select a, one of those templates. Uh, and it could actually come with a bunch of pre filled content, and then they, they just have to go and edit that content. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. And then you have CSS 
any of those levels, can you? The block, the template, or the theme. Yes, you theme CSS for all of those different levels, but it can it should be able to overwrite. So Gutenberg blocks generally provide a bit of CSS because like you need buttons to look a certain way or borders or whatever, but the theme should always be able to override that. That's really important because the themes the themes are always going to be responsible ultimately for the way your site looks. In the editor, which CSS is picked up? Is it the theme CSS picked up? Is it? Both. The, the, all the theme, both the theme CSS and the block CSS should be picked up in the editor. So the idea is that the editor looks exactly the same as the front end of the site because the theme CSS is being pulled into it. Okay. So just so, just to clarify, you can, if a block has default content built into the block, you can override that within the theme, or oh, sorry, within the template for the page template. So you can say for this page template, I have this default content, but if I don't pick that ten page template, then use this default. Yeah, so the block blocks may or may not have default content. Um, but yeah, if you if you're specifying um a a template which uses blocks inside it, you those and you do specify default content for those blocks, that will override the the normal default content for the block, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so another question, I suppose, is going to that, or just to it is you're, so you don't you only ever define, if you were, as a developer, defining a new block, you wouldn't define that within a theme. You would define that within a plugin? Yeah. OK. So you, can you not define them within a the theme, or is it just not encouraged? <laughs> um. I think you probably could, couldn't you? Because themes are pretty powerful. Yeah. yeah. Well. I, I don't think there's anything that would stop you from doing that, um, right. except for maybe peer pressure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or oh, yeah. maybe I suppose. But, but it, you definitely shouldn't be doing that. Right. You can, probably, but you shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Because one of the main reasons for that is switching themes. The the whole point of themes is that they are supposed to be um, they're portable. So if I've got one theme and I want to move to another one, I just switch it and everything changes the way it looks, but all my content's there. But if you delivered me um, some custom blocks with your theme and I've used your blocks and now I switch to another theme, well, I'm not going to have those blocks anymore because I don't have your theme activated anymore. So all of the content that was in those blocks will break. But you would have the same problem anyway, wouldn't you? If you switch, even if they weren't within the theme, if they were within a plugin, then you switch to a theme that wasn't aware of those blocks, they would then not be styled. So wouldn't you have a similar issue? Well, the I guess there's there's two things, aren't there? When you switch to a different theme, the plugin would still be enabled, so the blocks would still work. Um, they would be styled. They would be styled according to the way the plugin is styled them. But if the theme was, if one theme is overriding the blocks and the other theme isn't, then yeah, they wouldn't be styled. But there are there are rules, there are sort of like baseline rules that would apply to any blocks. So it should kind of stick. It, there might be kind of details that are are themed better in some themes than in other themes. But on a basic level, like your button should just be whatever color the theme sets. Okay, yeah, so the, the, when you're creating your plugin for your custom block, you, you give it a sort of default style, but then that gets over and within the theme, so it switches back to a default style, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. if, if, the, if the new theme doesn't account for that, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. More questions? Who would like to ask a question? It sounded like a really basic one, but people I know... Um, try to use uh, the classic editor and then move to Edge but ask me things like, how on earth do you add a PDF in it? Because when you try to add media, you get taken to the JPEGs that you can't find the PDFs, unless that's changed with a new version. I haven't looked at so that. So that was, we discussed that the other month, didn't we? Yeah. A couple months ago. And there is a open GitHub ticket for that, and they have been Still. discussing it, and I think it's scheduled for 5.2 okay. to actually be so fixed. Yeah, that is. It's about to be fixed. Yeah, no, it's it's fixed. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I've forgotten that. Yeah, that, 
that's actually that's worth um just reflecting on a, a bit because obviously Gutenberg's new came out and there's a lot of rough edges uh, and that's one example and there's a lot more um and it's it's just that's just how it is with new with new software that when stuff comes out it's there's you know you can't get everything working perfectly before you release it so what yeah so the thing to say is that gutenberg is very much still in its its early <laughs> stages it's young it people are working on it all the time to make it better and um and that's actually my last question my last question was how can i get involved and there's a lot that needs to happen there's a lot that you can help with whether it's um raising issues like this on github or just going onto that that issue and saying oh yeah this is a problem for me as well because the more people that do that the higher priority that will become or testing if someone comes up with a fix for that you can actually test it and say oh, yeah this actually works now writing documentation there's loads of things that, that people can do obviously gutenberg's open source just like wordpress so the more that people that get involved the better uh, i had a question um it's not really uh related to the we we just spoke about sounds very really interesting and great um but i logged into an old site that i made uh, a couple of years ago and i made it with visual composer um and i logged into it and went to a page and all my uh, visual composer composer elements had just been um, just kind of shrunk back to their short codes and that was just in the text editor and then it sort of said uh, get started with Gutenberg underneath it so none of my visual composer, composer elements were there to kind of edit and play around with. Um, is there a way to turn it off if you, if you don't want it? Has anyone else had that problem? It looks like yeah, it. Yeah, there's a plugin. There's a plugin. Yeah. Yeah. There's a plugin to turn it off. Yeah, you turn off just for a certain custom base types as well. There's a plugin to turn it off. It's the third, third most popular downloaded plugin on the repository at the moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. I didn't get that far. I was kind of making a big adjustment that I didn't really want to get stuck in. Okay. That's absolutely. Yeah, it's just a sort of plugin and it just, just wipes out because you don't have to visual on the text. And then it it will go all go back to how it was with visual composer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just saying it's yeah. still in the classic editor. Right? No, no, because no, you've got the visual composer elements still. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm off in there. Well, I'm very keen to get Ben's opinion on, on how it sits with visual composer and stuff because it's um, it's me that is taking over. Well, good man. Yeah. So it's creating. They say that the product was not there when I upset the. Uh, it, it seems to me it's just a way of increasing users, isn't it? It's trying to simplify the, the entry level. But that's not a bad thing because actually it's quite, I mean, as someone who builds websites and has well, to teach pizza. people how to use them, I can, I can uh, relate to a lot of what you're saying. Okay, so I'll stop that. It's gone. Okay, okay, okay. okay. yeah, I'm keen to keep talking to Ben there, but I've got to go and get the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can get him back. Yeah, great. Yeah, we're going to get you You're back. Sorry. There we go. What happened there? Um, so there was a question about Visual Composer and stuff breaking when. Uh... <laughs> that was me, yeah. Um, well, we kind of just had a chat about it. I think it's somewhat solved. Oh, good. Um, but, yeah. I did, I don't know what the solution is, so I'm glad someone else could help me. Apparently, <laughs> there's a plugin which uh, <laughs> strips it out if you don't want it. Okay. Um, but that's that's just for an old site, and I'll be. Uh, uh, and quite know. interestingly, you're saying it's what the second most, but third most downloaded <laughs> plugin at the moment, which right. is which is not great for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Ben, how do you how do you see the good about working with you know Visual Composer? And, in a dog bakery and agile or whatever they call it, you know, all the other page builders. How do you see it sitting? Do you think it's complementary or do you think it's sort of taking over a bit? Um, I think it depends on how those people adapt. So there's, there's definitely huge opportunities for those companies to work with Gutenberg. Basically, if you look at the, sh the blocks that ship with Gutenberg at the moment, at least, there really aren't very many. 
and there's still a huge gap in terms of what people really know, need to be building sites, um, both in terms of blocks and templates. So if, if you're working on one of those site building plugins like Elementor or any of those other ones, um, what they should be doing, what hopefully they're doing is putting a lot of work into building blocks and block templates that people can keep using. So they'll keep using their product, um, but they'll do it through the Gutenberg interface rather than some custom, uh, some custom thing. And that's actually much better for the user because like, firstly, as I was saying, if everything's a block, then you only have to learn one interface. It, but also, I, the problem with things like those page builders is you're, you get locked into one system. Like you're saying, when you convert that, that Visual Composer post to uh, Gutenberg, it just breaks because it doesn't understand it. Um, and that's going to be the case with any of those systems. They don't, they're not compatible. They're all completely uh, proprietary. Whereas if they're all using Gutenberg, for a user, it's way better because you can switch between, well, you don't have to choose. You can just use all of those different page building services and use one for one type of page and use for another for another type of page. So that's what I where I see it going. I, that might be optimistic. But. If I could just uh, ask you a quite difficult question. Say, hypothetically, you, you weren't working with a design agency in Tunbridge Wells, and they got uh, <laughs> clients uh, uh, all, yeah, completely, yeah. <laughs> for example, and, and, it, and you were using, and every one of your sites was using Visual Composer. Would you sit tight and wait to see what Visual Composer did, or would you be looking to convert them into Gutenberg and rewriting some of those key blocks? Um, are these sites that are being worked on now, or are they sites that are just like they were they were created in the past and now they're just sitting there? So all, of, all of our sites uh, they they refresh every year, but they don't completely change. The functionality has changed, but the look and feel change. A year but so that's really that's really more the theme changing rather than the functionality changing. It's not. We don't even change the theme. We just basically change the branding. But the point is, is that they're very used to using Visual Composer. And they're happy using it. They they don't know what Gutenberg is. Um, they'd, be, they'd be a difficult sell to say. You know, yeah, I I don't think I would. I think I'd definitely sit tight, see what Visual Com Visual Composer do, and um, so cer certainly you don't want to. Yeah, I can't see a good case for for doing that at this stage. Because at the moment, if I convert them to to Gutenberg straight away, all of that, like um, Dan just said, all of that code just gets squished into one block doesn't it yeah and although it renders still the user can still editing is a complete nightmare yeah exactly and really you, you do you feel that what the likes of visual composer are going to do is they're going to take a page like that and then when you lay a gutenberg over the top of it it's going to they, they're going to pop out into individual blocks all those different different <laughs> relevance I know, I know it's a very difficult question to ask i i don't know what what Visual Composer are doing? I that would be really nice if they did that. Um, that would be really good for users. I it's it's difficult to say what they would do because it's probably not in their interest, is it? Because they probably want people locked into their system. But I suppose they've got to balance that between: do I want people locked into my system and then actually have less people using it because they know they're locked in, or do I want to be open and then more people using it? So I don't know which way that will go. You have to ask them probably. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so if, if that is probably going to lose, how, how do you make money? How, how, does, how, how does Automatic make money? Uh, yeah. So we um, run WordPress.com, which is like a hosted platform for, for WordPress sites, and we sell plans, so subscriptions for that. So it's, it's um, Gutenberg like, is software as a service. Doesn't, doesn't make money. Gutenberg doesn't make any money. No, Gutenberg's part of WordPress. It's just all part of the open source Word, WordPress project. Yeah. So obviously, Automatic have also got Jetpack and WooCommerce. Yeah. And WordPress VIP. Yeah. Whatever it's called, VIP. It's just VIP, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so the, my kind of, the reason for doing this talk and the reason for a lot of the kind of things that WordPress, that Automatic does, is that we believe that the part of the success of our company is about is connected to the success of WordPress, and we want we want WordPress to do well. So, 
we do as much as we can to to make that happen and to make WordPress be successful. And we believe that if we make WordPress be successful, that will help us. So Ben, I mean, you don't have to answer this at all if you if you can't. But as far as I understand it, automatic employ people just to work on the open source side of WordPress, WordPress.org. Yeah. How many, roughly how many people inside of automatic work on WordPress hmm. Gee, um, <laughs> I'm I'm not sure um, off the top of my head. I know Matt says uh, we should. He says other companies should do five percent of their workforce working towards um, open source, and our, we have about eight hundred people. Okay. So let me see. I could I roughly know how many people. So let's see if it's let's. What's five percent of eight hundred? Forty people. Yeah, I would say. That, yeah, it's forty. Uh, I would. I would say we probably have about that many. Yeah, we've got. We have a a whole team dedicated just. That's all they do. That's all anybody does. Just in that team, they just work on um, core. Not even WordPress. They just work on like. Sorry, not even Gutenberg. Just like the core issues. Um, and then we have a team devoted to Gutenberg. Uh, we have people that do community outreach stuff, um, and then everybody is also encouraged in their day, daily work. Any work that we do that kind of benefits um, WordPress, we try and bubble that back to that project rather than just keeping it for ourselves. So yeah. I would I would say it's a it's a good number. Yeah. But it makes sense for us to do that because if WordPress is, is successful, it, it's good for us. Like. It benefits yeah. us, so why wouldn't we? Okay. And so how's it going, Gutenberg? I mean, that's a take up. We're the third best plugin. Is it's not, this is not the first. <laughs> <laughs> are you generally getting, you getting a lot of stick, or are you getting, like, uh, is it going down well? And the developer community love it, don't they? But is it? Um, I would say <laughs> I'm pretty shielded from all of that, to be honest. I just sit there making blocks all day. Um, but but from like th there's obviously have you heard of the classic press fork? So someone's actually forked yes. WordPress uh, and just stuck with Tiny MC as the editor, and that seems to be fairly popular. Um, and I, I it's just time will tell, isn't it? Time will tell we, what if people want to keep using Gutenberg. That's one of the nice things actually about um, what I was saying earlier about the approach that if people hate Gutenberg and they don't want to use it well you can just keep creating these classic blocks and just use the tiny MC and, and forget that Gutenberg ever happened so um, if that happens then that seems fine but like from what I can see and from the way that we're start, the opportunities we can see with our users especially with new users it just makes so much more sense for people to be using that rather than the old system and so I, I guess that kind of speaks to what you were saying earlier about should I upgrade or should I change my sites? If people are already happy with Visual, visual Compose and they know how to use it, it, I don't. It seems painful to teach them something new, but when you're looking at getting new clients on board, that's more I think when you'd be looking at well, how how could we do this with Gutenberg? Does that does that actually help us? What you're trying to do? Yeah, that's what you're yeah. trying to do with new ones, aren't you? Yes. Okay, ones. that's interesting. Ones, um, yeah, yeah. With the old because people yeah. are used to it. Yeah. But I am trying to get to grips with it, which, yeah. you know, with the new clients. And I think, <laughs> you know, I'll But I, uh, my problem with visual composer and the others is that they're really fat. And I'm hoping that Gutenberg's fat, as in, yeah, yeah. this is really too small. complicated. Yeah. Too, much, too many options. There's that. And then the use side, is too, there are too many options. But also, it, it runs tons of crap in the background. On the, the, on the front end of the site. On the, yeah, just generally okay. slows the sites down. I'm hoping the Gutenberg is a lot, of, is a lot thinner layer. It's obviously a lot more embedded. I suppose it depends how the the, the blocks get coded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that probably depends a bit on what plugins you install, doesn't it? So with Gutenberg, just with Gutenberg Core, you just have those few blocks, and it's it's pretty light. But then it depends what plugins you install, and and that's probably something that that different web agencies will do different things with. So some might build their own blocks. Some might have, oh, there's like a collect, they build up their own collections of blocks that they find that are useful. Uh, and it's sort of, that's sort of an interesting opportunity, isn't it? That these blocks are new. So there's a bit of competition in there in terms of getting your block to be one that gets adopted. 
Yeah. So a little bit, my last question, but I promise you this. But <laughs> so <laughs> hypothetically, you're. <laughs> um, say, for instance, you're writing, you're, inter you're writing a blog that interrogates custom post type, and you've got a number of different custom post types in your theme or your whatever or plugins. Whatever. You've got a number of different custom post types. Would you write a, a an export? Routine that exports those custom post types and presents them as JSON objects, and then writes separate JSON blocks that just interrogates, sorry, different blocks that interrogates JSON and presents it in a different way. Is that the way you do the architecture, or would you interrogate? Would the, would you write it to the block, interrogates directly with the custom post type? Um, I'm not sure I understood what your first option was. <laughs> well, I don't know either. I'm making it up. As, as I go. <laughs> The point being, if I've got a number of different custom space types that pretty much do the same thing, do right. I want to be writing blocks that you know to change and cut and paste? Is it not a more of an elegant solution where I put a, a layer in front of it? Would you not just have an option within the block to select what post type you want or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're talking about getting a list of the post types. No, how, would you, how well, so? How would you write a block that interrogates a custom post type in the in the most in, you know stylish way? I suppose that's really what I'm asking you. Mm. Um, I don't know. Um, I know that we created a block recently um, which did use an ex pre-existing custom post type, and it was a nightmare. And the developers all hated it and wanted to kill us for suggesting it. And we, we, we were going to create another block recently, which also reused the existing custom post types. And they were all like, no, this is a terrible idea. You should stop. And um, we looked at the usage of the custom post types, and we found actually people weren't using them that much for this particular feature. So in this case, we are not doing that at all. We're just creating blocks and reusable blocks. Um, so I don't know how you would do it, but I do know that it's quite messy and hard, and it might be better to look for a different option like a reusable block than to try and deal with that mess. They... Sorry, so that's not a very good answer. No, no I'm happy with that answer, then that sounds difficult. This <laughs> 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 isn't the post type above the block in that sense, because the post type is the the post you're, like the type of the post you're creating, whereas the blocks are within the post. So I'm not, I'm mm, it depends though, because sometimes like the custom post type might be a, a discrete piece of content within a post. So you have the whole post, but then you might be like testimonials is the example I was thinking of, where um, you might want a, a particular testimonial on your site on the one page and you want it to appear on all the other pages. And you might, we already have a pre-existing, in Jetpack you have this, uh, testimonials, which are custom post types in Jetpack. So the idea was, oh, couldn't we just get the block to read from the custom post types that already exist and reuse those? And um, the feedback from the developers who'd done that previously for a different block was, don't do that. It's really messy and hard. Um, if you send me an email, I can get more um, reasons for that. I can ask you guys. Because that's my problem. I've got loads of data inside custom post types. Yeah. And I just want to change the way that the user interacts with them and presents them. Okay. Okay, send me an email and, and we can talk about it. Does someone other than Dom want to ask a question? Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> about how to run his business. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong person to ask. Can you create a template and report the use to use only certain block types on that page template? So you can say recipes, you have to put ingredients, you have to put content there, so they haven't got a choice of what block type they want to put in the template. Don't map around with the design, which is just the... Yes. Yeah. yeah. So a bit like you would do with ACF. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you're saying you have to put your ingredients yes. there, you have to put an image there. Yeah. Right. Isn't that what the templates do then? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. I know that you can have, we have, you have parent blocks and child blocks, and the parent block can be very specific about what is in the what blocks are allowed within within it, what child blocks are allowed within it. Uh, templates are more flexible in that you, when you create the template, you basically give the user this is this is this collection of blocks, but you it doesn't restrict them. So it says this is like your template that you can work with. 
But if you want to move stuff around, once that's created, then you still can. So, um, so there's no option when you're creating a template to sort of say it has to have these three blocks and they can't be deleted and they can't you, they can't add any more. I don't think so. I think for that you need a custom block. Feature request coming up. <laughs> I, I think the problem is that that starts to get into the more functionality side of what a block is. So you'd actually have to create a block that was kind of more controlling mm -hmm. like that, which you could then put inside a template if you wanted to. But it's it's the, really a template is is really stupid. It's just like uh, an array of configuration options, and um, and it doesn't right. prevent the user from doing stuff once that's inserted into the page. You, it's like um, uh, trying to think of an example. From... That's what I'm saying. Couldn't one of those configuration options be no messing? It could, <laughs> it, it could be. Sure, yeah, but... It's locking. Yeah. Yeah, that's, not, that's not how they work. It's yeah. not seen anyway. Yeah, it's not how it works now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, we've done nearly an hour and a half yeah. with Ben, so <laughs> do we have any more, anything pressing that needs to be asked? No? I'm, just, I'm quiet. Yeah, Dom, <laughs> any more questions about your business? <laughs> Need a new accountant or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Ben go. I can see, we can see the light turn to dark. And yeah. Go. <laughs> <laughs> we let him go. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Ben, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.